Okay, we're rolling apparently. So, really happy to be here at JFocus, first of all. So, I'm Daniel Skanse, uh, and I work as the head of engineering at Pelterian, and we are an um, AI platform company. So, when I first started to think about this talk, I thought I should go some deep into some technical topics because we sure had a lot of challenges when we built our platform in that department. But then when I thought more of it, um, it is actually much more useful, I think, for you um, if I take a step back to explain a bit more what AI is about and try to sort of iron out why these, some of these challenges arise in the first place and how to avoid them. So this is uh, what I'm going to focus on. AI will impact every facet of life, just like the Industrial Revolutions did. We're not talking about some revolution in the future. The revolution has started, and it is happening now. To explain why I believe this, uh, I think it's good if I give you an intro to AI to sort of have some history so we can put this into some context, because there are many different types of AI, as we'll see. So I mentioned something about AI being a revolution. So why is this? In what way is AI disruptive? So to put this into some perspective, when the transistor was in, uh, invented, um, it caused the cost of arithmetic to go down substantially. Uh, this caused a disruption in society. Some jobs disappeared, new jobs appeared. The same thing happened when the internet came about. Then the cost of distributing information uh, went down. So in what way is AI disruptive? Well, now the cost of making predictions is going down. So, some history of artificial, of artificial intelligence then. It, came about, the, 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 the term, sort of it started to happen uh, about 60 years ago. Uh, in 1956, uh, John McCarthy defined AI. Um, he said it was the science and engineering for building intelligent machines. And that, I think, in a way, sums up pretty nicely what AI is about. It's about building some intelligent system. Back then, it was all about the rule-based systems. It was about formalizing rules in our heads into logic statements into a computer. In the Georgetown experiment, they successfully managed to translate 60 sentences from Russian to English. Uh, and then they were really, like, really, really ambitious, and they had these high goals, and they figured that in five years, we'll, able to do, we'll be able to, to <coughs> translate anything uh, between any language. Uh, and as we've all seen, uh, that didn't really work out, because it was a bit tougher. Uh, so in the 80s, uh, the, the, the focus shifted a bit uh, to be more on predictions um, based on the data instead of using rules. Self-learning systems, and these were superior to rule-based systems. It was a revolution in the AI. But those systems, they were incapable of transforming data in a good way. It still required a lot of feature engineering and feature extraction in order to make the data go into the models that, uh, that uh, they were using. So it was a still manual and very, very time-consuming consuming work uh, to be done there. But in the last 10 years, there was a new revolution. The technique was not that, that new, but it was suddenly available on a much bigger scale due to hardware, uh, hardware advancements. So deep learning has the capacity to represent and transform data as well, and this makes it superior to uh, older techniques in many aspects. And we'll revisit this in, um, later in the presentation, so it will become more clear uh, what this really means. So. AI is one of the most important things humanity is working on. It's more profound than, I don't know, electricity or fire. I mean, obviously, Google is committed to AI, AI but I think this quote captures the magnitude of the belief in, in, in AI, in, in, in this technology as well. So, I also think it's worth 
thinking a bit on the media perspective uh, on AI. Me media does it best to create some notion of mystery uh, and magic around AI. When Garry Kasparov uh, lost against the supercomputer Deep Blue in the 90s, um, he, he, he said this, I could feel, I could smell a new kind of in intelligence across the table. And I think this is pretty interesting because he actually understood the algorithm. He was a good programmer himself, so he, he had deep understanding of the algorithm. He was also able to use this knowledge uh, in his, you know, to his own benefit when, it, when he previously played against the computer. But the sheer force of this machine and the sheer force of what happened when this uh, very simple algorithm, it was not deep learning by the way, but when this really simple alg algorithm wa was applied at scale, uh, you know, it was, it, he, he couldn't beat it basically. So he lost the game anyway, despite his knowledge of how everything worked. So I think it's kind of interesting because despite uh, you know, the fact that there is nothing really mystical about the algorithm, it's still sort of like magic when you apply this, these principles on a big enough scale. And I think the same applies to uh, neural networks. <coughs> While it may look very, very um, impressive for a computer to do its magic, to understand things like digits, by the way, that, that is what hap what's, uh, this, um, uh, the, the image illustrates its images going in on one side, uh, on one side of, of, of a model and outcomes classification of these images as numbers, basically. It's uh, basically the, the, the hello world of deep learning. Uh, it's called MNIST. Uh, and I th also think it's really impressive because, because the source code for, this, uh, for, uh, for solving this problem is also in this image. It's 46 lines of code. So again, the principles is super easy to understand. And I mean, I think even us mere developers can understand it. So, what is the secret th uh, then? What is deep learning based uh, on? Um, it's inspired by the human nerve cell, the neuron. I, I say inspired because it's not near the real thing, but it's inspired in the notion that the, it's a mesh, a network of uh, interconnected neurons one neuron has connected to other neurons. Each uh, neuron, uh, sorry, each connection has a weight. These weights determine the output when data flows through the network, and the knowledge is encoded in these weights. So during training, these weights uh, are tuned based uh, on the data that is fed through the network. Um, it's as simple as that. Then, of course, it can be quite challenging how to sort of make sure that these neurons are connected in a proper way, but I'll get back to that as well. But the basic principle is simple. And why it's called deep, by the way. In the beginning, the computers uh, only had the capacity to train you know, very few layers, but the recent development of uh, GPUs, thanks to all gamers <laughs> out there, uh, it is now possible to train much deeper networks that can solve much more complicated problems. So, okay, I'll try to show why you um, as developers, or we as developers, I'm a developer myself at heart, why we really should care about this. So I'm gonna start by um, presenting you with uh, some problems, starting with a small one on the nitty gritty level and then work, work up to some really uh, adv advanced ones. So first off, we need to talk about CSV files. CSV uh, is a very underspecified format uh, and it causes grief with no end to the developers. Uh, um, it seems so harmless, but when in put into a production system, all hell breaks loose. Uh, so, is it possible to build something that can detect the data type in a CSV file with, uh, th that contains a lot of errors? Um, well. If you tried this to do it in a live system, you probably ended up patching up the code on a regular basis, changing it trivially over and over again. I see some nods here in the audience, so <laughs> I know I'm not alone. Uh, so, okay, CSV files, they're hard and they're annoying, but it's not really that hard. It is possible. It can be done. It just takes a bit of time and a bit of mindfulness. But what about finding and, cl and classifying objects in an image? 
I mean, without some sort of AI, this, to me at least, if you look at it from a sort of naive point of view, it seems quite challenging. I mean, how would you approach it? Open CV, something, feature detectors, convolution. But I don't know, how would you, how would you build these feature detectors? I mean, at least I, I would feel really you know, clueless on how to even begin with this type of problem um, using traditional methods. And further on, indicate the areas with the brain tumors. And you'd better do nothing wrong here, because uh, th these areas are going to be controlling a gamma knife that will cut out these brain tumors. So you'd better get it right. Uh, how would you start approach this project? Um, does pixel X belong to object Y? And even more, on an even higher level, how much power will these windmills produce tomorrow? I mean, yeah, well, what, first off, what data would you use? Uh, I don't know. Satellite images, perhaps. Sensory data from the, from the windmills. Other types of meteorological data. I would probably try to combine them in a way. You know, look at it, try to find some patterns in it. But it sounds really complicated, and I would, uh, it would probably be a massive task to get even something even near that would be even, you know, even close to being accurate. Uh, so basically, I, I personally, I wouldn't know where to start. So what do these problems have in common? Well, first, pretty obvious, they're very hard or borderline. Nothing is unsolvable, of course, but they're borderline unso unsolvable with conventional, conventional methods. <laughs> And deep learning can solve them. In fact, we have solved all of these problems with uh, artificial neural networks and deep learning. So what makes deep learning so versatile and powerful then? Well, first, I mentioned this in the beginning, but compared to uh, older methods, deep learning is so much more flexible. Older methods, like SVMs and others, they were focused around one representation, and it required a massive effort to convert the data you had into something they, co they can digest. Uh, basically, they were about tabular data. So you had to, if you had images, you had to you know, extract features and put them into tables that, that could be fed to these models. But with deep learning, this is uh, no longer a problem. You basically throw all the data you have uh, directly in, in the model, and it kind of figures out the rest itself. Um, so it's also flexible in the notion that you can reuse part of a network. So if you have trained a really big network on you know, image classification or something, you can extract parts of that network and reuse it and repurpose it for something else. So if you have your own images, for example, you can, you can train it uh, on those images and uh, have it learn much faster because you already did that big chunk of training on the, on the sort of big data set and, and so on. So it's really flexible to work with. And another, for me, <laughs> really compelling aspect is that modeling is possible for even for non-expert. So, I mean, to build models successfully without having a university degree in machine learning I mean, that is a really strong argument for me. I mean, that doesn't mean that I don't want to learn and understand the, the, the depth of it. But I mean, to be able to get started easily with this, to have fun and learn along the way, that is really compelling for me. And the, uh, the example shows an old score school uh, solution uh, for uh, retinal disease diagnosis. Uh, it contains uh, eight processing steps in order to like, convert the data into something that can be put into this model. Whereas the deep learning solution uh, on the right side, it's more, you know, you just take the image and then uh, put it into some convolutional neural network and uh, off you go. As a fun side note, uh, the, the, the machine learning team and the developers, we had an internal competition. We, um, uh, the, the task was to create the best model that could, um, uh, you know, mask uh, pixels of dogs or, or images of dogs in, um, in dog segmentation. We called it dogmentation. <laughs> uh, so, and it was actually one of the developers that won the competition. 
sorry, arguing there in the, in the audience. Uh, He's from the machine learning group. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it was a really, um, but, but, but I mean, it was down to a really ambitious tweaking of parameters. So, uh, I will not mention the time he spent on this. I can assure you that he didn't get much work done that week. So, <laughs> by providing a massive amount of time, he actually managed to solve this. Uh, um, so, I think it's really, you know, interesting. It's a lot of experimentation and trying out uh, new stuff and so forth. Sometimes deep learning gets a hard time for taking long to train. It can take, sure, it can take a day, it can take even weeks sometimes to train a really advanced model. But even though the training may take some time and requires hard, uh, specialized, uh, specialized hardware, the, um, doing the actual predictions is typically really fast. I mean, it can be, it's usually for a contemporary model, it's um, usually around a few hundred milliseconds. So it can be done, it can be used in, in, in sort of live, live services. So, again, is this technique, is it ready for the real world or not? Um, if you look at the bigger picture, every technological shift has two phases. Um, so I mean, so before, but so you, you'd better, you know, you, you want to know if this technique is ready enough because I mean, you, you care about your production system systems, so you don't want to bring in something that is, you know, not ready for for production that is too too changing too fast or too research or something. Uh, can you? I mean, it's a big task to introduce this. So anyway, are we ready to bet on this horse? Well, if you uh, look at the development of some other technologies. Steam, first of steam power took about 150 years from its, in, uh, its invention to become omnipresent in society. First, a long time was spent on innovating and developing um, um, the, the, the technology, and adoption was slow and limited. But when a certain point was reached, this changed and it spread rapidly across the entire society, and it became a part of it. And this second phase, it was much shor shorter, um, we call this phase the operational phase, and that is simply when the change happens to, uh, to the world. Electricity followed the same pattern, but it all happens uh, much faster. Same thing with digitization, and we are in the middle of this digital shift. So now, what about uh, AI? AI is becoming operational as we speak. And I think the numbers speak their own language. The race is on. The giants have already uh, or are in the process of putting AI uh, at the core of their business. And the smaller players are or will soon be following. So, oh, where's my water? There. So, <coughs> I don't know how many of you <coughs> that worry about the singularity. Uh, <coughs> the singularity and self-aware machines. If, in case you are, please have a look at the videos, and you'll probably worry no more. <coughs> so anyway, now we're ready to start talking about the challenges with AI. So we hear a lot about the success stories, but we don't hear so much about the failures, but rest assured, there are many. So interestingly enough, the, you know, there are a lot of technical challenges, but I, I don't really think they are the biggest ones. So, first off, same but different. On the surface, it may seem like machine learning is just another type of software engineering. After all, building machine learning models is a lot about coding. And I mean, you, that's the tool, basic tool you use, right? But as you will see, it's really very, very different. <coughs> so. When software engineering is about a lot about product development, machine learning is more towards uh, proof of concept and research. When traditional software engineering is about reliability and performance, machine learning is more about bringing, trying out new technology. Because, you know, as you know, it, um, it happens a lot in this area and they'd like to be on top of things. And when software engineering is more about maintaining and refactoring solution, machine learning is more, the machine learning community is more about experimentation. 
And this has caused different cultures to evolve, which has resulted in different mindsets, different tooling, <coughs> and different workflows. And why is this? I think the core of this is that an AI problem is quite different from a software engineering problem. Because software engineering usually has a clear goal, or usually, <laughs> hopefully, uh, and it's usually uh, fairly easy, or at, at least possible, to provide a clear path to this goal and then achieve the costs and resources that it would take to reach it. But deep learning is by nature experimentation driven. Some problems may have a solution, while others previously, um, I mean, sorry, some problems may not have a solution, of course, <laughs> while others may, may, you know, may be much easier than, than you initially thought they would be. So the cost of achieving the goal is really hard to estimate, and that makes, you know, puts a lot of stress on project management and, and processes and, and, and even up to the business levels. It's simply hard to manage expectations. Another challenge, fairly common one, I mean, deep learning is great, but it's no silver bullet. You need data, you, um, often a lot of it, to power it. And this is because the problem statement has moved to the data. So the data need to describe the problem well enough. Other, otherwise, you know, you, it will not learn anything. And with more complicated systems uh, that require more parameters, the need for data also increased substantially. And the other part of this is that while a problem may be very clear on the intuitive level, it may not be so easy to formalize metrics for it, how you measure the error, which is key to training these models. Trying to explain a problem to a machine learning expert, and you'll understand what I mean. So, um, the existing tooling uh, is not really made for solving operational AI problems. It's mostly tilted towards research and not development and solutions. And equally vice versa, if you look at, uh, you know, stuff like version handling, it's used for traditional software engineering. It's very messy to, to version handle these rapid, uh, pace of experimentation you have. It's also very hard to make sense of a lot of versions uh, where you, use, you know, tweak stuff. It's hard to find processes around this also to, to, to kind of conserve the knowledge and what you learn when, when, when you work with these problems. So, the, tool, the tooling chain, the tool chain now, I mean, it's a little bit like, you know, you get somebody a surprise visit and you get somebody for dinner and you kind of look in the fridge and see, see and pick whatever you have and try to make something of it. It will taste okay, but I mean, it's not near as good as it could be. So again, and even if you, even more so, it may be possible that code is not even the proper abstraction levels for solving these types of problems. We believe so, by the way. Um, yeah. This, this dependency graph, it's actually no joke. I installed the, the, these machine learning, these very basic machine learning libraries that you use, and then I visualized it. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, and th this is only a small fraction of the, tool the tools you would use for, for you know, real problems. You may use like FFmpeg, SOX, NLP libraries, and a series of graph and plotting libraries and much more. And that's only for the machine learning parts. On top of that, you have dependencies like graphic card drivers, cloud provider infrastructure, you know, Hadoop, Spark, or whatever, um, databases. So, and um, also worth mentioning, if you look at the machine learning libraries, TensorFlow, the, the, the pace of development is really, really fast. TensorFlow alone released eight versions, big versions, last year, not counting patches and bug fixes. Five of these contain breaking changes, and that's only TensorFlow. So it should be clear to all the developers that the glue code required and the pain of maintaining this type of dependent syst interdependent system can easily become uh, you know, too much for any mortal to take. I mean, just imagine you know, if, you, if you, for some reason, need to go back and retrain a model you trained two years ago 
how would you even go about it? Everything is outdated. You have to kind of go back. Sure, Docker can probably solve some of it, but it's still going to be a big, big mess to, to try to figure it out. And then we, we haven't even started to talk about data dependencies either, because data can be dependent on each other, but that's for another session. So, proof of concept. Uh, this is another challenge. To believe that the proof of concept would be the same as operational AI, just because it works in the lab doesn't really mean it will work in the real world. So, a few years ago, a colleague and I, we had promised the sales team that we would give them a really cool demo app. We were new to deep learning and we'd played around with, it, with, the, with the MNIST. Uh, uh, MNIST case I showed you before. So, um, I wrote a small iOS camera app, and my colleague, he wrote a small API uh, around it to, so we could serve, serve the model. So, eager to show our work, we uh, you know, asked the sales department to, to go into the big conference room, uh, and we you know, wanted to show this. Luckily, no customers were present. So, <laughs> uh, well, we, uh, we started by drawing a, um, a I did it on a piece of paper on the, on the whiteboard, and well, we didn't get the, 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 what we were hoping for, so we tried it some more. But no matter what digit we, we draw, drew, you know, we, we didn't, simply didn't manage to get it to work. And uh, the sales team, you know, they, they, they were not that impressed, so they left the room despite our protests uh, that, you know, it's fairly similar, you could think of it. No, they just left. So, anyway, so we, 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 con uh, we continued and uh, tested it some more, and, well, eventually it was <laughs> back to the drawing board. Uh, so, we would built an 8 classifier, classify, uh, classify everything as an 8. And I mean, of course, we could have told the sales team to, you know, only draw eights, and it may have worked, but that felt a bit like cheating. So we, we you know, tried to understand the real problem instead. And it was, you know, the, the rookiest, can you say that, mistakes uh, of them all. Uh, we, the, the, the training data did seem to not match the live data properly. I mean, sure, we turned it into black and white, but if you look at these images uh, uh, and these, and these are, by the way, a bit grayish. They're whiter uh, in, the real, uh, in the real data set. It's a pretty big difference. But to us humans, we don't think so much of it, so it's easy to miss. And even more embarrassing, some of our colleagues even wrote an article about these challenges and much more. So maybe we should have read that before we got started. <laughs> but we were new on the job, so. Uh, <laughs> and to put this into perspective, here is a simplified uh, view of sort of the AI proof of concept workflow. And this is, you know, it's very often looked like this and when you sort of claim you've solved something. Because what you do is you do some one-off work uh, on the data to prep it to something you can iterate quickly on. And then you, you feed it into your model and you, you know, you do some pre and post processing there in, in the middle. And then you, you analyze it and then you, you iterate on it uh, many times. Uh, and uh, then whenever you are, you know, you get the results you like, you, you, you deem the project a success. But what if we would take this proof of concept into an operational system ready for live use? Well, then it would look this way. I mean, okay, this is a fairly advanced system, so you can probably get around with some fewer boxes, but still, the modeling part and the analysis part is a very, very small part of, of a bigger ecosystem that you would need to consider when you put this into production. A large-scale operational uh, system typically contains big data, distributed systems, parallelism, high performance, and specialized hardware, and much more. And I usually you know, consider one of these to be uh, enough to make a problem really challenging. And to build operational AI, you suddenly have all of them. Okay. So, obviously I'm not talking about pixels and typography here. It's rather how you should design your systems and, uh, and workflows. So what's the most important things to keep in mind when, uh, when approaching AI? Well, first off, 
I mean, I think it sums it up. I've talked a bit about different workflow. But I think this one is the principle or the guideline that rules them all. Take nothing for granted until you tried it. Again, AI is not software engineering. It's a fundamentally different workflow and mindset. It's experimentation driven. So systematically uh, explore and experiment. And also uh, make sure to, to uh, maintain the ecological validity by, by testing the model all the way out in your real systems uh, now and then. Don't do the same mistake as we did. Um, and also sometimes you have to accept that there simply is no solution to a problem. And then also nothing is really ever finished or solved. Conditions change. So you may have to go back and revise old solutions. For example, if you build a house price prediction service, uh, this engine is strongly dependent on the market and will have to be retrained uh, on new data uh, at regular intervals. The other guideline is quite obvious, potentially, but extremely important. Be data and use case driven. So without a pro uh, clear problem statement, anything, can, uh, anything and nothing actually can be proven. And without data, there can be no, no solution. So this overconfidence in the data you have or its quality is something we see often. So be very careful before going to the projects to, to request the data and use cases. Uh, <coughs> another important principle, I, this is sort of a, you know, applies to basically any distributed system, I would say. But from, from the beginning, you know, just make sure not to change data once you've written it. Shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. Uh, I would uh, <coughs> the, the biggest, the biggest, uh, w one of the bigger problem we've had w with our platform is when we made an exception to this rule. It was really messy and it required a lot of work to make it, you know, to, to make it function. Um, so. Immutability is also the foundation for traceability and versioning history. So when working uh, with uh, deep learning, you typically create hundreds of versions of a model. And uh, this workflow, experimentation-driven workflow and mindset, it requires you to uh, pay extra care of maintaining overview of what directions you have explored, why something works well, why something did not work uh, may be equally or even more important than uh, remember. So you need to capture a lot of documentation and information when, when, you were, when you work with these problems. Um, so make sure you have a, you know, tooling um, in place that enables you to, to uh, see how a model has evolved over time in steps, to see what particular model that has been used into uh, the serving, uh, in, the, in what is deployed and integrated with the business system. And you should also be able to, at all times, uh, be able to go back and see what that particular model was trained on, what data it was trained on. Because you may see new errors based on new conditions that change, so you may have to go back to the data and understand why it performs badly. Um, so, uh, and I think that that is evident in the house price prediction case I just mentioned. Think of scaling from the beginning. I think, f f I mean, training can take a long time. Uh, so, uh, and you typically, you know, trigger a lot of parallel jobs in order because of this. So, um, and I mean, the, then you, uh, I haven't even gotten started with pr automatic parameter optimization. I mean, advanced techniques that would spin up or, you know, try out different, auto automate the way you tune parameters and so on. And that will increase the, capa the need for scaling immensely. So the system should be scalable from the beginning. And the engineering depth of trying to make a non-scalable -sc um, system scalable I mean, you probably know this, but it can be enormous and sometimes push you back to, to the drawing board. It's simply a different, um, it requires a different design from the beginning. Uh, yeah, I don't think I have to elaborate this one so much. But I mean, when, when, when you talk about data uh, in these days, it's natural to talk and consider GDPR. Store your data consciously and be aware of personal identifiable information. Consider what you do uh, in scenarios like when a user requests to have their information deleted. 
Uh, and it's usually a good question to ask yourself, could we as a company pass a due diligence if somebody started to peek into, into the data we have? And like scaling, this is also something that is really hard to introduce at a later stage. Because you know, you have data in backups, you have to go back. I mean, I'm sure you have already faced a lot of these challenges now that they're pushing so hard for this. Um, costs matter sometimes a lot. I mean, we're talking about some expensive hardware here. So massive scaling on GPUs without cost awareness, it will quickly put an end to any serious AI effort, especially when the CFO gets the bill. So the methods you can use to keep, uh, to keep the cost down is first and foremost at monitoring at a very early stage, so you know you know what jobs you have up and running. You, you know, you, you, so you don't forget machines running there in the cloud cost that, you, that cost you a lot of money. But you should also, you know, try to build support for things like preemptable instances. It, that, that requires a bit of work, but it's worth it. <clears throat> you should also consider early stopping mechanism to abort or at least stop the training when, 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 uh, when it doesn't learn anymore. And then this is something to keep in mind. It's not like pushing a button, the, the, the you know, remove glue code button. It's not that simple. It's super hard, but it's more something to be, to be aware of and be conscious of it. So be restrictive uh, by you know, bringing, on, bringing on new libraries. It's really common in the machine learning world to just you know, bring in everything, but that can really bite you um, from behind <laughs> when, when you, you know, uh, do that in, in, at scale. Uh, and whenever you have really vital libraries that you, you depend strongly on, you need to make a decision. But usually it's good to at least try to wrap them so you can replace them, um, you know, if you would be forced to do that. Even libraries like TensorFlow, it seems to be, right now it seems to be the thing everybody uses. But, you know, frameworks change, they die out. So, who knows, Fr TensorFlow may not be around forever. Also consider creating your own formats and do, do not depend on too much on formats from other third-party libraries because they, they may also change. And it's better, you're better off having control of your own format so you can provide your own migra migration paths and so on. So, I mean, use, use things like semantic versioning to keep this together, version your formats and also how they interdepend. So, Where to start then? So, approaching AI in your organization is actually not so different from introducing other new technical areas. In a way it is, but I mean it's a big endeavor and it's about starting small and proceeding in small, uh, small steps. So, it's not like you necessarily have to start by putting out ads and recruiting a big machine learning team directly. I would say start small, start with the developers. Usually you can find some people with interest in these areas. Give them some time to play around with solutions and get into, get into the area. Why not? I mean, you know, it's not a big investment. And as I said before, this technique is, you know, very, well, very, but at least quite easy to get started with. And once a few people have some more knowledge of this, it's about caring about the what, what the data you have in your organization. So start making inventories of the different data you have uh, and start to collect it. Um, and it's also a bit, it's very important to consider the data you do not have because it's time to start. I, I think the, the keynote, uh, Ellen, she, she mentioned it. It's about you know, making sure you have the data when you need it. So start collecting the data you, you do not have. It's also time to spread the knowledge. I mean, maybe not super big um, in, in the entire company, but at least start to st talk to people that can, han can have an interest in this and other departments. Discuss potential use cases. And then you pick one case. And how exactly what case you pick 
it's quite important because it cannot be mission critical because, because that would be too risky. But still, it has to have some business value because w what you want to do is to build some sort of internal success story about it. So um, pick one suitable case with business value. And uh, now the, 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 the guidelines from bis before will start to become important. So consider platform and frameworks and libraries and, and whatnot, but try to, uh, you know, do not build everything on your own. You can even be prepared. I mean, you don't have to care about all the guidelines fully because this is more about proving a case and getting uh, all the way and getting more knowledge. But at least st start thinking those in the, in, uh, along those lines. And then learn from the case you just did. Continue to spread the knowledge in the organization. Devote more efforts. Recruit. Establish processes and workflows uh, within and across departments. And also, quite interesting, revisit old problems with new data. So, do not reinvent the wheel each time. Think in terms of a platform uh, and framework early on. I mentioned this before, so early on, I mean, uh, well, maybe not in, in step two, but in, in step three, like step four somewhere, you need to start thinking of a framework. Uh, so, and I should also say, what, what, when I talk about framework, I know TensorFlow is sometimes called a framework. To me, it's more like a math library. A proper framework should support you in many more ways than just modeling and training. So what I'm talking about is something that is, you know, a bit more aligned with the guidelines I mentioned before. So what would uh, this type of framework um, look like? This is a very minimalistic, bare-bones framework for modeling. But essentially, you would take data you know, uh, from your, your warehouse or data lake or whatever, wherever you have it. You would feed it through some sort of you know, data processing component where you can join and combine data. Um, <coughs> that, that, that processor would serve it for, for the, training, uh, the, the, the training service. The training service would be horizontally scalable, so you can trigger a lot of trainings at the same time. So the training is basically a wrapper around TensorFlow, some math library. It can contain some pre-processing and post-processing steps. On top of that, you would have some orchestration that can or orchestrate these uh, training, uh, training jobs. <coughs> Alongside it, you would have analysis that could take data and artifacts that are produced from this training, and so you can analyze it and see if this um, you know, the models you're building, if they're, they're good or not. And uh, throughout the entire system, you would have, uh, you would collect metadata so you can keep track of, of these models, you know, what data that has been used and what has happened with them uh, all along the way. <coughs> of course, there will uh, be more aspects to this, like version handling and, 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 uh, and so on. But, but, I mean, this is start small, so this is sort of the mindset you should have at least the minimum. And <coughs> we talked about the modeling. It's also very important to consider the serving part. Again, proof of concept is not operational AI. So a, minim a minimalistic framework for serving would be something like an API in one end that would uh, consume the live data. The data would go through a data processor and then on to the, uh, the, the serving, the, the sort of modeling, the serving of the model. Um, what's also interesting to see is that this, this uh, you, you would probably want to, to store the data that you both, the data com that comes in and the, the, the data you, you feed back to the user, you would probably want to store that also so you can use it for to train uh, the model, to, to improve the model uh, over time. And then obviously you would have a lot of monitoring and, analyt and uh, analytics. And the reason to keep these fairly separate is of course that when you serve your models, it's um, a different, different availability requirements. If the, if, the, if the modeling framework goes down for some time, sure it's pretty annoying, um, but when the serving framework goes down, it starts to cost a lot of money. And you may also consider do not take for granted that you would, I mean, some components you would reuse, like the data processor, it could potentially be reused. Um, <coughs> sometimes you can use the same, um, 
the same system to serve your models. Sometimes you cannot. It depends a bit uh, on the requirements of, of, uh, um, of um, your needs on how to serve the model. So, um, again, consider existing solutions. Building this type of framework is not a small task. So do the research properly, talk to people, get out there, play around uh, with AI, get familiar and get a good understanding of the area and your, your requirements because it can, you know, obviously be very different. Consider existing solutions and when you do that, consider the speed of getting started, how soon you will outgrow the solutions and how much you will depend on them. So I want to end this speech by re reminding you of the guideline that rules them all and you may actually get the opportunity to, to practice this particular guideline if you visit our booth. So, have a beer, come chat with us in the booth. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> by the way, by the way, uh, there is a link here, a Bitly link. We've collected some, some starters if you're interested um, in more in AI. So you can, if you go to that Bitly link, you, you'll see some, some good um, pointers to, to, to AI. Thank you.